and he is omnipotent. This is a heavy verse right there. Glorifying God is everything in the heavens and everything on earth. And this includes thing, things, includes the bodies of the disbelievers. Because the disbeliever does not control his heartbeats. There's a specific number of heartbeats. And the disbeliever does not control that. God controls that. So the human body is glorifying God. Every atom in your body, every atom in this carpet and this wall is glorifying God. They follow, we have chemists and physicists here, and they know that every atom in the wall or the floor or the ceiling inside this light, they all, every atom has a nucleus and a certain number of electrons and they're con continuously moving in a specific way. It's just, it's a micro, microcosm of the, of the cosmos. Glorifying God is everything in the heavens and everything on earth. To him belongs all kingship. God is the one who hires you or fires you. God is the one who determines how many dollars you get. Not anybody else. God decides the provisions. Somebody was telling me today that uh, they wanted, they were getting another child and somebody asked, can you afford it? That's the wrong question. The question is not, can you afford it? The question is, can God afford it? Because God is the one who brings the people into this world. And God is the one who provides for them. When a child is born, God provides for that child. Not you. To him belongs all kingship and to him belongs all praise. He is omnipotent. And God, uh, this is, these are all important attributes of God that we must know. Omnipotent means he backs up his guarantee and he guarantees you perfect happiness if you are in his domain. If you follow, if you do your part, carrying out the commandments, God will do his part. Perfect happiness, success in everything you do. Guarantee. God's guarantee or warranty is much better than General Motors. Guarantee or warranty. When you have a warranty from Lee Iacocca, you have confidence in it because because he backs up his warranty seven years or seven thousand miles and you take this piece of paper and you're happy with it well God is omnipotent and he guarantees your happiness <laughs> it's true God is giving a warranty in this Quran and he says if you do your part I will do my part this is in Surah 2 at the beginning as you know it says, Do your part, I'll do my part. And our part is nothing. What is it? Five prayers a day, fasting the month of Ramadan, are things that are good for us. This is our part. It's like God is saying, Come, I wanna, you're going to be happy and I'm going to give you all the money you want and all the health you want on condition that you do your part. A lot of people say, No, I don't want to be happy and healthy. I want to be miserable. You don't want to... Yes. Now the pa God's part is overwhelming. It's great. Verse number two. So the word omnipotent backs up this guarantee. The guarantee is outright in the Quran 23 times in the Quran. God guarantees you perfect health. For example, in Surah 10 verse 62. I'd like to go back to this because uh, a lot of people can't envision they can't envision that, but God controls every atom in their bodies and can decide how much health they have. When God tells you, I'll give you perfect health, when you do, my, when you do your part, God the Omnipotent means that. You have to share the new Quran, Greg, with somebody. Yeah. This is the importance of Omnipotence. Okay, in Surah 10, verse 62, God says, absolutely, God's allies or God's people have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. And then it gives you the description of these people. It says, those who believe and lead a righteous life. Those who believe in God and they lead a righteous life. They are nice people, they are honest, truthful, and they, they, uh, their God is, God is their God. God is always in their mind. 
everything they do, everything they say. Those who believe and lead the righteous life. For them is happiness in this world. I'm quoting now, I'm quoting this, those verses, verse 62 of Surah 10. For them is happiness in this world, and this is God speaking, and in the hereafter. So this warranty or guarantee from God is repeated 23 times in the Quran. Now, as you know, uh, Satan tricks the other people who deviate from the Quran and they have other sources like Hadith and Sunnah and uh, God knows what, all kinds of sources besides the Quran. The number one Hadith is, look, goes like this. The most righteous among you is the most miserable. This is a very famous Hadith. Because Satan knows that he, he cannot give them happiness. And actually the Hadith goes on and says, the most miserable are the prophets, and then the saints, and then the believers. That's right. So, and this is an authentic Bukhari hadith. And goes directly against the Quran. The Quran go, it says otherwise. It says, those who believe and lead a righteous life are guaranteed happiness. I'm going to go back a little bit again and uh, talk about the title of the surah, Mutual Blaming. Mutual Blaming is one of the names of the Day of Judgment. It's called the day of resurrection, it's called the day of judgment, it's called the day of reckoning, it's called the day of mutual blaming, because this is the day when a lot of people will be blaming each other. You're the one who told me this, no, you're the one who told me this. You took me out of that place, you took me into that place. So there'll be mutual blaming. In fact, uh, the people of hell will spend the eternity beating each other and thanking each other for beating each other. <laughs> so if you give me 10 kicks, I'll give me 10 kicks. They say, okay. <laughs> Mutual blaming. One of the names of the day of Zatman. Verse 2 says, He is the one who created you. Then among you there is the disbeliever and the believer. God is fully seer of everything you do. There are only two kinds of people. People in God's kingdom and people in Satan's kingdom. There's nothing else, no other choices. Although there are categories within each, each section. For example, the uh, Satan's kingdom has the disbelievers and the hypocrites. And both of them fall under the bigger category of disbelievers. Other names for believer and disbeliever is appreciative and unappreciative. These are other names. Appreciative of God or unappreciative. And we're going to get to this in Surah 76. Not today. <laughs> <laughs> but these are the other synonyms of believer and disbeliever. Appreciative and unappreciative. Because God gave you a lot of good things in advance. And then He asked you to show your appreciation. Let us take, for example, your eyes. Just your eyes. And I've shared this with some of you before. If you're walking out in the street and somebody puts a gun to your head and he says, your eyes or five, five prayers a day, what will you do? Not your eyes or your money. You're going to say, you either give me your eyes or promise me to do five prayers a day. Well, what will you choose? If this is a real... That's right. Easily, right? So God gave you your eyes in advance. If you want to appreciate them, just close your eyes for a couple of minutes. <laughs> it's, it's something that we take for granted. I hope none of you is color blind, but if you look around and you see the red, the blue, and the green, all these nice colors. <laughs> God's people are perfect anyway, so you notice. Alhamdulillah, thank God we all have two eyes each. So God gave you these eyes in advance and He said, you do five prayers a day. Appreciative and unappreciative. The people who are not worshipping God alone are not appreciative. I didn't mention the lungs or the kidneys. Nobody, nobody will want to substitute God's kidneys for the technologically advanced artificial kidneys that they have. They are small now. They're only about six feet tall and four feet wide and three feet deep. And these are the most advanced 
kidneys. They take the patient's blood completely into the machine, and it's not as good. And you should see those people. So we thank God. He gave you all these things in advance. Number three, he created the heavens and the earth for a specific purpose. Designed you and perfected your design. Then to him is the final destiny. <coughs> Footnote 64.3 says, We are in this world due to God's immense mercy and most gracious will to redeem us after we committed the gross blasphemy. See the introduction in Appendix 7. You know, a lot of people say, why did God bring me here? I didn't want to come here. Because they don't understand why we are here. When, if they read the Quran, they will know why we are here. And they will realize that we committed a gross crime billions of years ago. And God decided to give us a chance to redeem ourselves, to denounce idol worship. But the majority of people insist on idol worship. The vast majority of Christians insist on worshipping Jesus and the vast majority of Muslims insist on worshipping Muhammad. <coughs> Just a human nature. They're all humans. And the Quran makes that statement in advance. It says most people, no matter what you do, will not believe. Because God knows these are the creatures who committed that blasphemy billions of years ago. And I don't want to bore you with repetition of what it is. <coughs> And then God says that of the minority who, that will believe, the majority will fall in idol worship. Because God knows, I mean, this is what brought us here. We did not uphold God's absolute authority. And this is why we have that tendency to idolize saints and prophets. The vast majority of people fall in that trap. So he created the heavens and the earth for a specific purpose, which is redeeming those among us who deserve to be redeemed. So we can go back and join, rejoin God's kingdom. If we fail, then we'll be exiled from God's kingdom, and that is hell. It only makes sense, like I told you at noon today, if you're a chairman of the board of a company, you don't want the lazy employees will cause the company to lose <coughs> and instead of uh, God firing us completely he said I'll give you a chance to educate yourselves and redeem yourselves and then come back to me this is the specific purpose God designed you and perfected your design and the design of the human being is fantastic and we never tire from <laughs> describing it Like I was uh, using somebody the other day to give the example. We well, can use Greg now. See, Greg is scratching his face. Okay, his hand is like this, but it goes like that, and then it turns and scratches his face. He takes it for granted. But this is a, quite a design. <laughs> there are two bones in your arm here that can go around each other, so, so it can go like this. I mean, how many times do you take it for granted? You go like this. You, know, you don't even think. <laughs> God perfected our design. Can you scratch every part of your body? <laughs> this is God's design. Your arm is not too short. You can reach every inch of your body. Not me, but... <laughs> <laughs> if I maintain the natural weight, I, I will. Say. <laughs> so it's my fault. <laughs> If there is any flaw in your design, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> Designed you and perfected your design. Anything that goes wrong, this is very important because people will tell you, how about the person who's crippled? It's very important to understand that that person is a victim of Satan. Something, something, they, they removed themselves from God's protection and that caused the Satan's uh, victimizing them. And 
the, the perfect example that we know and we talked about it before many times is uh, Rabbi Kushner of Boston. Rabbi Kushner of Boston. His book is full of blasphemies against God, unfortunately. Not all the Jewish people are like that, but he is a rabbi and he, is, he should know better. But, uh, he wrote this book when bad things happen to good people and he totally misunderstands, he does not understand Satan's role at all. And he says that the bad things happen because God cannot control everything. God is not omnipotent according to him. His book is just full of blasphemies. Now what happened to him, uh, his son was born with this progeria disease, rapid aging disease. And in 14 years he died. So what happened was Rabbi Kushner, by blaspheming against God in this manner, he removes himself from God's protection. And, and Satan fooled around with the embryo, with, the, with his son, when he was inside the mother. And the child was born defective. So whose fault is it? Whose fault is it? The child was victimized by Satan. And Rabbi Kushner was victimized by Satan in the same way. Because God guarantees your health through uh, the angels, God's angels. He has, God has some of the best surgeons in the world. If you, if you are to, anything wrong happens in your body, you can go in your body and fix it. And Satan has the same ability because he was an angel. So remember that any, anything, any flaw is a result of Satan's interference. But uh, when you look around here, this is the basic design of God. Designed you and perfected your design. Then to him is the final destiny. When he gave you two eyes, because some people have accidentally lose one eye, so they have another spare. Even though everyone is perfectly guarded, nothing happens against the will of God. And God promises to protect you as long as you are in His domain. He gave us two kidneys in case one of them stops for some reason. And remember, two ears and one mouth. <laughs> I should learn from this and stop talking. And put on the spot here, because General Spooner went AWOL. He was supposed to be here talking. <coughs> he called from Memphis today. He's all right, by the way. Okay, uh, verse 3 ends by the statement, to him is the final destiny. Okay, so every one of us is going to go back, and if we did our part, we'll be prepared to join God's kingdom. If we did not do our part, and we did not develop ourselves, we will not be able to be there physically. God forbid. The people who did not prepare themselves will go to hell on their own volition. God will not put anybody in hell. They will go to hell on their own volition. And we have examples. The bugs. You put the light fixture on and you screw it in very tight and still the bugs, they work very hard to work through this thread and go inside to die. This is how the human beings do. They, go to, they work very hard to go to hell. So God gives us lots of examples in this world. Number four, verse four. <clears throat> he knows everything in the heavens and the earth. And he knows everything you conceal and everything you declare. God is fully aware of the innermost thoughts. Did you ever come across people who think that God is not aware of them? So who am I? God doesn't pay attention to me. They think God doesn't see them. <laughs> But uh, this verse here is telling us God is fully aware of every single ant. There are some termites in this building somewhere. We are not aware of them, but God is. And He knows how much they are supposed to eat and when to stop them. <laughs> God is fully aware of every single creature, every single atom. He knows everything in the heavens and the earth, and He knows everything you conceal and everything you declare. We, ju we just cannot have a complete comprehension of God's omnipotence and power. 
I mean, look how he created you and the blood pumping in your body in a perfect perfect design if you sleep in your arm for a couple of hours at night and the circulation is not right you know you get a nightmare or something to move you because the circulation has to be perfect He knows everything you conceal and everything you declare. So if you do your part, God is aware of it. Everything is recorded. Consciousness of God is very important. Wherever you go, just remember God is with you. We must be conscious that God is with us here right now. He's aware of everything we're doing. He's aware that you're here to study His message. You want to redeem yourself and go back to God, join His kingdom. God is aware of that. I mean, these are heavy verses. Verse number 5 says, Have you noted those who disbelieved in the past? then suffered the consequences of their decision. They incurred a painful retribution. God is teaching us from the past history and these are factual, factual observations. We know that Pharaoh drowned in the sea. We know that. We know that Moses and the believers crossed the Red Sea. There were no bridges then. No Golden Gate Bridge. But they crossed the Red Sea <laughs> from Egypt to Sinai. We know Pharaoh drowned and his body is full of salt in the Cairo Museum. Have you noted those who disbelieved in the past then suffered the consequences of their disbelief, their, their decision, decision? And usually it is the end that counts. See, the believers may go through a purification process, abolishing process like the, the stone that goes through a lot to become a gem but there is these machines, the polishing machines are very severe so the believer may go through that but uh, he or she will emerge like a gem in the end and will have, will have this, all these guarantees will be fulfilled the, the purpose of a purification process is just that, purification to make you a perfect human being a person who does not lie, cheat, trustworthy, righteous, purification. And God will take each one of these at a time and cleanse you from it through a polishing process. Remember Shahan's khutbah on Friday when he didn't want to do the push ups? <laughs> See, he's young. And he's going through the polishing process. But he will emerge like a gem. Purification process done by the master purifier. But those who disbelieve, their end is always bad, always. But their last 15 or 20 years are the most miserable years of their lives. And the opposite is true with the believers. I think tonight we're going to come to the law that says that nothing happens to you except in accordance with God's will. This is one of the two important laws. The other law says nothing happens to you except as a consequence of something you have done. These are negative, negative. Nothing except. Nothing happens except as a, conse as a consequence of your work. I was talking to my nephew this morning in Egypt and he was telling me that uh, he's doing everything right and he wonders why he gets some problems. <laughs> so I went with him through a, a typical day or something and discovered he doesn't do the morning prayer. Maybe once a week he does the morning prayer before sunrise. So I, I taught him the law. He said the law is nothing happens to you except as a consequence of something you have done. I told him that God loves him 
and wants him to do the morning prayer. This is probably what, what God is choosing at this time to purify him. Every time he misses the, the morning prayer, he'll, he'll get a pinch until he, he does the correlation and realizes that God, God is aware of him and like his watch as if he's the only one on earth. <laughs> and whenever he misses the prayer, he gets the pinch. The correlation is immediate. And this is why we have also the other law that says worship God in order to attain certainty. This is how you attain certainty because with this immediate correlation, <coughs> you're going to realize that God is watching you as if you're the only person in the universe. <coughs> and when you make a mistake, you get a pinch. It's a kind pinch. It, it, it hurts, but it, it gets your attention. <laughs> it doesn't hurt permanently. It is the kind that is restorable. God's pinches are all restorable. You don't lose a finger, for example, because you cannot restore that. But you, you get a pinch that is restorable. You get a headache, for example, because the headaches go away. You lose a few dollars, but you can get them back. Multiplied many fold. So this verse number five reminds us <coughs> of these two laws, <coughs> two important laws. Don't forget them. <coughs> I think we're going to get to the one that says nothing happens except in accordance with God's will. I believe it is in this surah. Oh, okay. And the other law says nothing happens to you except as a consequence of your work. <coughs> to very, nothing happens. I mean, it's a, quite a statement. Begins with the statement, nothing. ما أصاب من مصيبة إلا بإذن الله. Starts with the negative. Number six. This is because their messengers went to them with clear proofs. But they said, "Shall we follow humans like us?" They disbelieved and turned away. God does not need them. God is in no need praiseworthy. See, they made a mistake when they said, shall we follow humans like us? Because the messengers are not, are not uh, the ones to, uh, that are being followed. It is God's instructions that are being followed. The messenger is one of the people around, which is the same as they are, and he himself is required to follow the instructions. So, we are all following God when we when you look at God's teachings and follow them. But they hear their ego is, is, uh, is an important test. So we're told that the painful retribution that is in verse 5 came to these people because their messengers went to them with clear proofs. When Moses threw the staff became a, a serpent in front of Pharaoh and swallowed everything else, they still did not believe. God made the Nile into blood in front of them. They couldn't drink for seven days. And they told Moses, ask your God to, to give us water again, we will believe. As soon as he became water again, he said, na 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 na. <laughs> we will not believe. I mean, what is this? Frogs, lice, locusts, nine plagues. And every time they said, ask God to relieve this and we will believe, and then they, they re, re, reneged. So, God is fair. When they drowned in the Red Sea, they deserved that. But God gave them enough warnings. This is because their messengers went to them with clear proofs. In this day and age, we have the mathematical code of the Quran, <coughs> proving this is God's word. But they still make all kinds of excuses to avoid it. Number seven. <coughs> well, God's, I won't go back to six. God's proofs are always clear and overwhelming, as we are experiencing right here in this mosque. The mathematical miracle of Quran, as you will see, I'm writing it now in Appendix 1, is just overwhelming. 
I'm using here just the word God as an example and this alone is enough to prove that this is not human made because the word God now here we are in the 20th century using computers and we are sophisticated educated people three of us Lisa, Emily and myself we're working on these numbers the number of the word God we are not writing them we're not inventing anything we're just counting them keeping track of them and you have no idea how many mistakes we make computers and all so the, it makes us appreciate the American even more I was typing a number 2492 2492 for example and I switched the 9 and the 2 like a 2429 so I was off by about 70 <laughs> And there are many other examples where I was off by one or two. But the Quran is perfect. 2,698 of them, that is 19 times 142. And if you take the verses, wherever you see the word God, see, for example, in this page, we have verse 1, 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You take these numbers. In the whole Quran, wherever you see the word God and add them up, the total is 118123, which is also a multiple of 19. And this would be printed on the last page of the Quran. <coughs> this alone proves that this is not human made. I just, I just don't see how they would face God in the Day of Judgment, people who can look at this and still reject it. Uh, I'm just I'm trying to emphasize the words clear proof. So clear. I mean, Muhammad couldn't do this. How, how will you keep track of the word God in <laughs> the Quran without computers when we made mistakes? And it's already in front of us. <coughs> Verse 7 Those who disbelieved claim that they will not be resurrected. Yes, indeed, by my Lord, you will be resurrected and you will be held accountable for everything you have done. This is easy for God to do. And God set the system so it is automatic. Tomorrow morning before sunrise, you're going to have two choices to make. You have a decision to make. You're going to get up before sunrise and do the morning prayer or you will not. Only two choices. If you force your body to get out of bed and do the morning prayer, you will grow. Your soul will grow. And to put it in our world's terms, you will make a deposit in your post-retirement account. A few million dollars. Just with that one prayer tomorrow. It's actually more than that. I'm just using these numbers of this world. The other choice is that you, uh, you become a slave of your body and you sleep. Because your body is telling you, oh, it's so much fun to be in the pillow. The pillow. <laughs> your body is telling you that. So if you're a slave of your body, you're going to sleep and you lose because the body is going to go to dust. You are going to live on with your growth and development or your shrunken condition. God made it automatic. So in the very end, you're going to be born into the hereafter what? Either developed, complete person or, uh, or a deformed, shrunken person. It's in your hand. Those who disbelieved claim that they will not be resurrected. Yes, indeed, by my Lord. Remember, these are mathematically composed letters. God is telling them, Yes, indeed, by my Lord. This is the Quran speaking, by the way. Yes, indeed, by my Lord. You will be resurrected and you will be held accountable. You'll be held accountable in this manner. Remember in Surah 17 where it says, Nobody will need to be asked, What wrong did you do? It would be obvious who developed and who did not develop. In Surah 55, remember the verse that says, on that day the guilty will not be asked about any of, of their guilt or their sins. You don't need to. <coughs> also in Surah 17, we, we learn that uh, the differences in the hereafter will be fantastic, will be great. See, the difference between uh, Hani, a child, and his father, 
is five feet. In this word, five feet. But in the hereafter, the difference between the people will be like somebody will be as big as a cat and the other will be as big as Phoenix, Arizona, or the state of Arizona. So the person as big as a cat, you're going to ask him, what did you do wrong? <laughs> it's obvious. The difference will be huge. See, we're really tiny, we are very tiny. An angel can hold the earth in his hand, see? And you can be as big as that. Remember, we were all in the same, in the same company, billions of years ago. Yes, indeed, by my Lord, you will be resurrected and you'll be held accountable for everything you have done. This is easy for God to do. In fact, it's already done. On the day of judgment, when God comes to our world, the people will be automatically stratified in the, according to their size, of degree and development. If you're strong enough, you'll be able to stand the presence of God and you will enjoy it. You'll be in heaven. If you failed to develop yourself, I'm not talking to you, of course. It's the people in the street who need that, to know that. But the people who fail to develop themselves will have to run away from God. They cannot stand the presence of God. Too much energy. And that's why God is advising us to do the five prayers, to fast the month of Ramadan, to be charitable, do all this. He gave us specific things to develop our soul for our good. Because see the end of the verse? Verse 6, excuse me. It says, God is in no need. He, didn't, he doesn't want to bother you and have you get up before sunrise just to annoy you. Why does God want you to get up before sunrise? What does he benefit from that? Nothing. It's you who will benefit from that. As a matter of fact, uh, my, my nephew is complaining what the specific problem was the depression that gets, gets depressed once a month or so. And this is directly related, if you remember Douglas's khutbah, it is directly related to being up in the morning, early. Remember the hat with the light? And that research that was done indicated that people who, were, who had extra light in the morning, not at night. This light, Douglas? In the morning. So it's not just, you cannot lengthen the day from the night side. It is getting up early in the morning that, that uh, induces certain chemicals in your, in your head and causes the depression or, or not. There is a, a direct correlation, those who study statistics, the correlation is 1.0 between sleeping too much and headaches and depression. If you sleep more than 8 hours a day, you're guaranteed to have headaches and maybe depression. So God is, uh, is, is advising you for your own good. God is in no need. Number 8. Therefore, if you are smart, you shall believe in God and His Messenger, and the light that we have revealed herein, God is fully cognizant of everything you do. This is God's message to the people. After showing us the, the positive incentives and the negative incentives, God is giving you the conclusion, therefore you shall believe in God and His Messenger. Why? Why does God want you to believe? If He doesn't need us, it's because He loves us. God loves you, He wants you to believe and follow this light of the Qur'an to be redeemed, to be saved, to be happy, here in this world and in the hereafter. You see this verse that talks about retribution? In sort of in uh, verse five, you see a lot of people make a mistake thinking that they have to die first and go to the grave for millions of years, and then get up before they receive their reward or their punishment. And they say, "Oh, go forget it! Come on, for millions of years." They think they don't realize that the happiness and the retribution happen here. It is repeated so many times throughout the Quran that we pay here. It starts here. 
when you make deposit in your post retirement account you, you draw interest here and benefits in this world or you shall believe in God and his messenger and the light that we have revealed herein God is fully cognizant of everything you do number nine the day will come when he summons you to the day of summoning that is the day of mutual blaming here you have two names of the day of judgment the day of summoning you will be summoned it is as sure as the sunrise tomorrow morning all of us past present and future generations will be summoned before God and that's the day of mutual blaming anyone who believes in God and leads a righteous life God will remit his sins and will admit him into gardens with flowing streams they abide therein forever this is the greatest triumph so our part is so easy and this is why mutual blaming because people who, who did not believe will find someone who misled them took them away from uh, the redemption I'm gonna stop here and see <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, um, so in verse 5, it, it goes along with that <coughs> idea, you know, whatever you do, is, if, as long as you submit it to God, you're doing what God wants you to do. Okay, and, um, and God doesn't even allow the disbelievers to do things do things that he doesn't know. Um, he's in control of the actions of the disbelievers too. Um, <laughs> one of the ways he does that is that he sends angels to protect protect the believers from the disbelievers' actions. Okay, so if um, he knows that something needs to be protected, he'll send angels. And it, it says that in verse 6, okay. Then we go on to verse 7. The spoils of war that God bestows upon his messenger from the banished inhabitants of the town shall go to the God and the messenger in the form of charity to the relatives, the needy, and the alien. In this way, it will not be monopolized by the rich among you. Any gain spoils that the messenger gives you, you shall accept. And whatever he forbids you, you shall leave. Beware of God. God is most is strict in imposing punishment. The spoils shall also go to the poor immigrants who were evicted from their homes and deprived of their properties in seeking God's grace and pleasure in supporting God and his messenger. These are the truthful. Okay, I'll stop there. Before it shifts the gears again. And <coughs> you read about the spoils of war <coughs> and how um this shouldn't make the, the spoils of war shouldn't be given to the rich to make them just richer and more powerful. You know, there are people that need things, and they should be given to them so that you know to be fair. It's I know um, I think about like in World War II again, how Hitler and all the people they were they were taking all the riches from the places that they um, yeah. invaded, and you know the rich just got rich got richer and more powerful and you know the poor were left on their own and God is most fair and so he says give it to the poor and those who need it in the Shia sect they, uh, they took advantage of this one fifth business and it is common uh, uh, a Shia village that uh, a man with a black turban would go to the house and say, Give me one fifth of everything you own. I'm a descendant of the Prophet. And they will give me one fifth of everything they own. This tour? That's what some people told me. They put El Khums. One fifth. So it's, it is a, a misinterpretation of this, of this uh, law or abuse. One of the most abused verses, verses in the Quran. Is verse uh, 7 where it says whatever the messenger gives you you shall take 
and whatever he forbids you, do not take. It has to do with, uh, with the spoils of war, but they, uh, they make it to mean hadith and sunnah. So there is abuse. All the sects of Islam, so called sects, uh, of course, in Surah 6, verse 159, it says, if you divide yourself into sects, you do not belong to God or to a messenger. So both sects, the Sunnis and the Shi'is, are not Muslims. By their own admission, you ask, are you, what are you, I'm a Sunni? Who's going to say that in the day of judgment? What are you, I'm a Sunni? What are you, I'm a Shi'i? <laughs> you don't say Muslim. So both of them abuse uh, these uh, verses in this particular surah. And you know something? I do go along with them. I say, okay, what the messenger gives you, take, and what he forbids you, don't take. He gave you the Quran. He uttered only the Quran. So even though they abuse the verse, I do go along with them. Are there any uh, questions on this? You're going to forget that you have an invisible soul, uh, giant behind you and with your kids, with your affairs. Don't forget that. <coughs> okay, we'll go back to verse 9. And done. And those who established, had established their homes and their faith previously readily welcome the immigrants who come to them. They find no hesitation in their hearts to give <coughs> them what they need. They even prefer them over themselves, even though they themselves may be in need. Anyone who spared the stingy nature of himself, these are the winners. As for the immigrants who came later to Islam, they say, Our Lord, forgive us and forgive those who preceded us to Islam. Remove from our hearts any hatred towards the believers. Our Lord, you are the compassionate, most merciful. Okay, these are fairly straightforward. Um, you know, people that you when when a person comes to you and they're in need, a Muslim is going to help out. You know, when when you see that there's a real need, you know, and they even you go out of their way to help a, a a needy person as long as it doesn't interrupt their worshiping God alone. Okay, that always comes first. Um, and uh, then it says the immigrants who come later, you know, they, you know, they ask God to help them. Um, well, it says forgive those who preceded them to Islam, but then it says um, to remove any hatred from the heart. Okay, and the the believers should always hang together. Okay, there was, um, what is it? There's a verse, I wrote it down, 3, 3, 103. Sorry, 3, 103. Um, you shall hold fast to the rope of God all together and do not be divided. Be appreciative of God's favors upon you. You used to be enemies, and he reconciled your hearts by his grace. You became brethren. God thus explains the revelations for you that you may be guided. And the believers sir, should... Sir, sir, the believers should be united, you know, and there shouldn't be hatred. And, and we should ask God, you know, to help us, you know, um, not be enemies or to remove any hatred between us. Um, then it goes on to um, verse 11. The hypocrites said to their allies... Let me, uh, let me uh, okay. give you a little rest here on this two verses, 9 and 10. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to... Uh, this is this gives me a chance to, uh, to uh, thank God and be proud of something that our community uh, does. And it's a perfect example of living the Quran. We, we all know Emily. She, uh, she works Friday nights. Unfortunately, but soon we better give her time to work here. But she packed everything in New York and she moved here. And she had there was a period of time when she was looking for a job. And she has no means she had no means of support. And I tell you, during all this time when she needed help, this drawer is full of envelopes with Emily's name on it. 
people were pitching in and helping her. And she kept her on her feet until she was standing on her own feet. I don't know who all those people are, but you know, we're a small community, we're not wealthy. But uh, this drawer had enough support for Emily. We were sealed envelopes with her name on it. And uh, I passed them on to her, and uh, that helped her. Uh, just like she didn't feel the. But, uh, but this is an example of immigrants who joined the believers. And the people who are established helped them. And I know, we will, I mean, this is not the only example, I'm just giving you a good example. But this, uh, this would always happen, this always happened in the past. And it happens naturally. When you're a believer, God guides you into doing these things. So I just wanted to uh, note this, and also I want to go back to the uh, protection and give you... Uh, I think we learn best by the real life examples of things that happened to us. I'm sure uh, Lori will not mind mentioning her accident uh, some time back, but it is an example of an invisible invisible giant who was with you. Uh, Lori was in, in an accident, she was thrown out of the car, and then she took care of the driver. Her sister was driving. And her sister went to the hospital. No, nothing happened to her. She took care of her sister. Now, if you're thrown out of a car, you will hit something, or something will hit you. But no, nothing. I mean, you can imagine the invisible giant just carrying her outside in perfect safety. And this was a nearby track record. So many, many examples. That was one of them. Real life examples. We thank God for teaching us the real life and through the Quran. <coughs> Go ahead. When it says, um, move from our hearts to be what's it with saying there that some believers may have some kind of nature? Yeah, which uh, verse is this? Ten. Ten. As for the immigrants who came later to Islam, they say, Our Lord, forgive us and forgive those who proceeded us to Islam, removed from our hearts any hatred for us. These were people who were fighting each other. They were trying to kill each other. You know, and then uh, they disbelievers became believers and joined the camp of the... So, and these are people who killed uh, my brother, my cousin, my father, you know, in war. They were, they were engaged in war. And now they joined them. And they know that this guy killed my father. Or this guy killed my brother. And now he's a believer. So. And God did remove hatred from their hearts and they came like a family. I mean, you have to take yourself into those days and uh, <laughs> understand what was going on. Even today, I mean, we hear, we hear so much in the news that's bad, it's negative about Muslims, that in this culture, it's hard to find the right words. And it's hard to find the right words. In this culture, in this country, you can come to think of Muslims as being horrible people. And then if God chooses to guide you to his, then all of a sudden you can know the difference. And, and Well, they can't forgive you too, but um, it is easy exactly. to, to have the wrong impression of Islam due to uh, the so-called Christians. Yep, they took a good job giving Islam a bad name. Yes. They don't really blame the, the Americans. But also, it doesn't have to be a deep-seated hatred. It can be just differences between people. There's always going to be difference, differences between um, well, just personalities. And you know, you kind of got to make compromises and so forth, so that the believers are united and stay together as a family. It's a very nice yeah. prayer. You know, we move yeah. from our homes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are we ready to go on? Eleven. Okay. The hypocrites said to their allies who dis who disbelieved among the followers of the previous scripture, "If you are banished." We will go with you. We will not obey anyone against you. If we are fought against, we will support you. <laughs> God bears witness that they are the liars. If, if they... But the hypocrisy is lack of belief. Okay, so the belief is not there. And what they're doing is they go along with uh, whatever group they're with. So they're really worshiping their own ego. Is that the choice that they're making with themselves? Yes, of course. It's a choice that they're making. And if so, why some are making Is there anything to God or genetically or naturally or that way? Is there anything to be a second point behind the 
conclusion that they reached on their own, that this is a decision they made. We, we study our surroundings and we look at the universe around us and we decide to believe in God, disbelieve in God, or go along with the crowd wherever we are. <coughs> so these are the three kinds of people. The believers, disbelievers, and the other The definition of a hypocrite is one who says that he's a believer when in his or her heart are not believers. They say they are believers and uh, usually they don't know that they are not believers. So God give, gives us criteria in the Quran, for example. Uh, I know now for a fact that uh, they are forbidden by God from saying La ilaha illallah without saying Muhammad Rasulullah. I mean, I did my own experiments. <laughs> I used my education to run some experiments. I find it uh, true. I mean, there is, uh, <coughs> the last time I challenged the person, I told him, you are forbidden by God from saying La ilaha illallah. And he could not say La ilaha illallah without saying Muhammad Rasulullah. He was unable to say it. So here is a person who claims to be a believer, but he's not. So God gives us the criteria. Criteria. One of them is when God alone is mentioned, they don't like it. When when Muhammad is mentioned with him, or somebody else is mentioned with God, then they like it. This is in Surah 39, verse 45. So there are criteria in the Quran that will tell the person whether he or she is uh, a believer or not. So the definition now a disbeliever is one who says he doesn't believe. That's a disbeliever. And the Quran writes about them two verses. But uh, a hypocrite is one who says that he or she is a believer when they are not believers. And this is why the Quran writes 13 verses about them. Because they are more uh, damaging than the disbelievers. The disbeliever, you know, you, you know the position. But the hypocrite is, uh, is a person who claims to be a believer. What can you do? <laughs> They never call themselves yeah, right. yes. There's nobody on earth who thinks that he or she is going to hell. <coughs> so, but we know from the Quran that the majority of people are going to hell. <laughs> First, before you say anything, I confused you with Mohsen Biryani. Really? I called you Mohsen, but well, I forgot your name. Uh, because you just. It's okay if you confuse me with Mohsen. Yeah, you say you are Mohsen, very close. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, wait, 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 Okay, I'm not losing my hair, the guy doesn't have any hair. <laughs> 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 Give me your name first. That's the I'm Hamid. Hamid, okay. Now we're okay. uh, going back to our discussion, uh, does Bolan categorize the uh, hypocrites uh, worse than a non believer? Yes. Is that the reason that there are no verses about them? Yes. Yeah, there's a statement in Surah 4 that says the hypocrites are in the lowest pit of hell. Now, uh, a good example of the, of the hypocrites, uh, if I may say so, is Khomeini, for example. 
Right. The person who thinks he's the leader of the Islamic revolution. He's the biggest hypocrite of all. Exactly. Uh, uh, but he really, he believes, he sincerely believes that he is a, a believer. But he doesn't act according to the Quran. Go ahead. Uh, <laughs> now the Quran definitely says that the hypocrites are worse in the lowest pit of them. Because, uh, here, I mean, before the whole world, the whole world looks at them as uh, Muslims. They're acting in the name of Islam. Now in the last four weeks, they executed 400 people in Iran because of uh, drugs, supposedly. Yesterday, I think, the BBC gave five Yesterday, Right, this makes them 400 in four weeks. Now, the trial takes one week. And, I mean, they don't, maybe some of these people are insane. Maybe they have pain and they need to take drugs. Maybe they don't even take drugs. No, but so, uh, this is the name of Islam. No, I, I had a letter from my mom. They were anywhere. They saw, they saw them in any uh, street anywhere, and they were so scared because they had young uh, kids, and they were so scared of, because of this. And they don't like somebody uh, was killed because of that. But I had another letter. They said, yeah, when they kill some of these, that was at least they can see it anywhere. This drug river, and that's. Because we are here, we don't know. That's what my mom doesn't. He, she's not in this uh, any politics or anything of this. Right. That's what the letter I have from her. And we don't. We are here. We don't know what's going over there. If they keep the drug is over there because of this situation, because the young people they don't have anything over there. And the drug is is all over there in the country. Yes. And this is easy. When you you want to buy a drug, it's cheaper than it. You you buy a cigarette. Pack of cigarettes. So uh, no, the uh, heroin. Heroin. Yes. Yeah, that's that's the worst thing when you can buy it cheaper than that. It's all over the place. Yeah, it's all over the place. Yeah, but who said that uh, drug addicts or drug dealers should be killed? Then that is that from the uh, Islam. They do it because they they want to save. I I don't know. I am not talking about. You save the country. Save the country. The country needs to be saved from them. <laughs> no, because I don't know. That uh, this is not something. What? Well, you know, this is a regime newspaper. I don't know if I believe this or not. Well, I'm saying, I'm saying, once in a while they can even. It is happening. It, this is this is uh, one app from a hundred, but uh, you know they can't really deny the whole thing. You know, they try to. Uh, this this precedes the true Islam. True Islam will come to Iran. Uh, and one more, let's just say, because 10% of the population of Iran is having the two parts. So, in five minutes, according to the population. They're addicted to drugs? 10% of the whole population. What country is Iran? Iran is not a country. Well, I don't know. It's a young people, not the old people. This is the worst name. Well, 10 or 15 percent of the Egyptians have been smoking hashish for the past few years. And nothing has happened to them. This, <laughs> this is their problem. Nothing has happened to Okay, back to Dana and verse 1. Well, I'd like to point out that we refer to verse 16 where it says that Satan says disbelieve, and then he says, I, uh, when, you know, um, then when the person disbelieves, he says, okay, you know, I fear God myself, you know. <laughs> Bye. I don't want really to have anything to do with you, you know. Bye. <laughs> and it's a very strong verse, so I would like to point that out. Um, we refer to it quite often. <coughs> um, Satan, Satan himself knows who, who really controls things, and he fears it himself. Okay. And on to verse 18. O oh, you who believe, beware of God, and let each of you examine what he or she has advanced for the coming day. You shall observe God, for God is cognizant of everything you do. Do not be like those who forget God, so he made them forget their own souls. These are the wicked. Not equal are those who have deserved hell and those who have deserved heaven. Those, have, those who have deserved heaven are the winners. Okay. 
as Muslims, even on a, on a daily basis or, basis or even every hour or moment, every time you can remember, think about what you, we should think about what we're doing, you know, make sure that it, it's what God wants, you know, and um, make sure that we're on the right track. And, and our pr prayers help us do that, you know, by praying we get back on the right track and back to thinking about God. <coughs> it keeps us from falling into sin. And um, then in verse 19 it says, Do not <coughs> be like those who forgot God. Um, there's a verse in the psalm we use it with the kids all the time, you know, remember God so that he may remember you. Well, if you forget God, you, it's, it's like Dr. Uh, like Abdullah was talking about one time in Hutu, you pick your own Lord, you know. If you pick your job or whatever is the one that you occupy your mind with the most, well, you've forgotten God. You, you know, that job becomes your God. <coughs> That's the one you worry about, the, think about the most. And so, <coughs> when you think about something other than God, um, or I'll put it, if you occupy your mind with something other than God, um, then you forget to feed your own soul. You know, you you aren't thinking about God so that He can help you in your daily life, and you um, remember God. Uh, it's just a, like an equation, you know. <laughs> it's it's a balanced kind of equation. You know, you remember God. He remembers you. You forget God, and you starve your soul, and God, you, you pick some other God other than God. <coughs> and those that pick other gods, you know, are the losers in the hereafter. Their souls are. That asking God for forgiveness in itself is an act of remembering God. I want to give you an analogy from this life, okay? Just think what David Dixon is doing to guarantee a good life <laughs> between the Audu Bilang in the Shaitan of Rajim, we seek refuge in God from Satan, whose end is nearing, inshaAllah. <laughs> Bismillah Rahman Rahim, in the name of God most gracious, most merciful. Uh, tonight we start uh, with Surah 70 and maybe beyond, depending on our teacher, a deep yuxel. Take it away. Should I read the Arabic or No, no Arabic. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a questioner may question... Sur Sur Surah 26 prohibits reading Quran in Arabic for non-Arabic people. Surah 26. 26? Yep. You didn't know that? Come on. Oh, 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 yes. He knows everything, that's why. <laughs> yeah, Surah 26, remember this. It says, uh, do not prohibit the reading of Quran in the language other than what the people understand. Because it said that, uh, in fact, it says. Uh, no, it doesn't say that. I was going to say it sounds Chinese to them. It sounds like a different. God says they, uh, they, will not, they will not be blamed if they don't believe uh, yes. if you read it to them in a different language. Okay, back to Adib. A questioner may question the inevitable retribution, for the disbelievers none can stop it from God, possessor of the highest height. 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 The angels, with their report, climb to him in a day that equals 50,000 years. Uh, this question is always has been questioned uh, to every messengers and about the uh, last day, about the end of the world, and always people has been ridiculed this day, but uh, in the future uh, when uh, we be close to the end of the world, for example, about. 200 or 250 years later, this question will be very uh, widespread and everybody will ask this question and 
Muslims million or billion of Muslims we discuss this subject with these believers and all verses about the end of the world will be become a real fact and the believers will know the end of the world and the unbelievers will ridicule this, will mock at them and they will create a great uh, dispute between believers and unbelievers uh, but uh, only we, we now also discuss this matter and when we say the end of the world will be in that time unbelievers or unbelievers uh, will ridicule us they will ask when uh, here God and uh, God our God gives us uh, the relativity of the time uh, says a day a day uh, of your Lord or a day of heaven heaven and divine the day is equal to 50,000 years your years uh, in another verse we see that this may be 1,000 years these two different scales show us this time is not absolute it is relatively it's relative for example I think everything is relative to us for example, heat is uh, relative to our heat. Uh, we have 37 Celsius degree. If the weather more than this, it is heat to us. But if less than this, it is cold to us, the weather. For example, the, the density of our meat, what do you say, <coughs> what? <coughs> flesh, yes, the density or our flesh, uh, it has a, a density, and if we touch something that has more density, we say this is a uh, hard, solid. solid, and if less than it, we say it is soft, and we compare, we uh, conclude, we uh, get information about our en environment by our uh, Standard. concessions, Standard. yes, Standard. standards, yes, thanks. And also our standard is our life. We, we live s about 70 years in this world. Our scale is this 70 years. Uh, a fly, the standard of fly is three months, about three months. Three months of a fly is equals our 50 years. Uh, this is standard and... How, how old are your dogs, Lydia? The oldest one is how old? In human, in human uh, life is... Okay, so this is what the deep means. Yeah, <laughs> so the dogs escape, yeah. And uh, here, uh, the, uh, in the first four, there is a word that has uh, two or four meanings, two or three meanings, word Ruh, it, it has been translated as report, reports, uh, or revelation. In Quran we can find these words used for revelation, <coughs> or for Gabriel, for Gabriel, uh, an angel. It has both two meanings, and here Rashad has translated it as with their reports okay this this all do you have any question about these four verses may I uh, uh, I think we should point out here that uh, Gabriel is the only this is only job and he's the only one who does the job of carrying revelations from God <coughs> to the world any new information or new revelations. <coughs> Something that was never known before comes from God to this world through Gabriel. So this is why one of his names is the Spirit or the Revelation. Uh, 
Because when God says, I blow into Adam from my spirit, it's, it's a word. Or Jesus called the word of God, uh, a word from God, because he, he was created by a word. <coughs> be, a word from God, be, and he was. With, the same with Adam, and Gabriel brought that word to Mary, if you remember. So, uh, but, uh, here the angels go to the first uh, universe, carrying reports about things happening here as well. So, and they were given the relative uh, speed. You know, just like Lydia said, the dog is 10 years, but in human terms, it will be 60 years. Uh, we're, to we're told here that uh, if you travel a distance in one day, the angels, will, uh, in 50,000 years, the angels will cut it in one day. In uh, Carl Sagan's uh, last novel, he's, he concluded that the speed of light is very slow. It really is, because nothing would be done in the universe if things were happening at the speed of light. And we, our favorite example here is the Prophet Muhammad's ascension to the first universe. If he were traveling at the speed of light, he would still be in one, one hundredth of the Milky Way galaxy. He would still be going on his way. <laughs> of course, that did not happen. He went and came in the same night. God took him up. Same light. There is a famous equation about the <coughs> relativity of the light, and uh, according to this equation, when you exceed the speed of light, there is no time. Uh, the time becomes zero. So this is the theory of relativity, of Einstein. Yes. If you travel, if you travel at the speed of light, time disappears. If you travel faster than the speed of light and go into the negative. It may be wrong. Huh? It may be no, wrong. No, not wrong. Let us say, uh, let me uh, explain it very quickly. As the, our picture travel at the speed of light. Okay. If you turn the light on, I will see it at the speed of light. So the person, Mahmoud, will see this later than me, because there is a fraction of a second. So once someone turns this light on, I will see it first, then Mahmoud will see it, because it's traveling at the speed of light. Our pictures travel at the speed of light. If, it, if the sun is turned off for, for a second, we will see this after eight minutes, because it will take eight minutes for the light. So the picture of anything travels at the speed of light. So let's say uh, a deep uh, scratch his ear and then sneezed. Scratch his ear and then sneezed. Now this, somebody's taking a picture from a mile away. Let's say somebody can take a picture from a mile away. When he scratches his ear, after a fraction of a second, they will see that, the camera will see that and take a picture. Because his picture is traveling at the speed of light. Okay? So at the speed of light from here to there, it will take a certain amount of time. And then after that, he will sneeze. So let us say, I am here, and I'm going to travel with his picture at the speed of light. So if he's, uh, if he's scratching his ear and I'm traveling with that picture at the speed of light, I will always see him frozen at that position. Okay. This makes sense? Because I'm traveling with him at the speed of light. That picture will be still. So now, uh, oh, let's say he sneezed before he scratches here. So, but if I if I go faster now, at the speed of light, I will see his his picture when he sneezed before that. Did I confuse everybody? So I'm traveling with him at the speed as he was scratching his ear. So, but if I travel faster than the speed of light, I will see his picture when he sneezed, which was a few seconds before he scratched his ear. So I go in the past, because I'm going faster than the speed of light. If I go even faster than that, I would see him uh, put his glasses on, which is something that happened before he scratched his ear. So let's say even if I, if I walked in the room as he was scr scratching his ear, and then I take off with his picture at the speed of light, I will see what happened in the past before I came into the room. This is how I'm trying to simplify it. I have probably complicated it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me. But this is what uh, if you go at the speed of light, then time will stand still. I will always see him holding his. If I travel at the speed of light, time stands still. He's holding his ear. Yes. If I go faster, I will see what he did before I came into the room. He sneezed. He put his glasses on. Whatever happened before. Can I give you an example? Okay. Confuse us more. Hadrat 
1,400 years uh, light years far away from us. Let's think a star. There are many stars that far away, farther away. From that uh, star, uh, let's uh, think that there is a civilization, or we went there, but just now we are there, and we are taking the photo of uh, this Earth with a very sophisticated telescope and detail. We could get the f uh, picture of people, persons, and we could take the picture of Muhammad and the bottle of Badr from that uh, star. <laughs> it is possible, but yes, impossible. Those, those persons are traveling in space now. Yes, yes. because uh, just uh, uh, it will reach uh, that yes, star uh, that only now. Yes, yes, only now. Things that were happening on Earth 1400 years ago are reaching objects in heaven that are 1400 years uh, light years away. It's true. Also, if that uh, star explodes right now, we will not see it for 1400 years. Yes. Because <coughs> that's how long it will take for, for uh, the speed of light to come here. The speed of, light, the speed of light is very slow, and what we're told here in verse uh, <coughs> verse four that the angel travel what we what we spend fifty thousand years traveling if we travel at our maximum speed which is the speed of light the angels will do it in one day. And by the way, this is not a fixed this is not a fixed uh, relationship because it can be different. It depends on where you are in the universe. For example, you go to the moon, your day will be 14 of our days. This is something we can do now. We can go to the moon. And you're going to have 14, 14 of our days in continuous day, light. And then 14 nights, 14 days that equal one night on the moon. If you go to Jupiter, you're going to have 365 days of light. The day equals one of our years. And uh, even on Earth, if you go to Alaska, you're going to have six months a day. No, but this is different. So it depends on where you are in the universe that uh, our day is different compared to their day. Back to it. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 5. Therefore, you shall resort to a gracious patience. You must be patient, a gracious, a gracious patience. For they see it far away, while we see it very close. The day will come when the sky will be like molten rocks, will be like lava. The mountains will be like fluffy wood. No friend will care about his close friend. When they see them, the guilty will wish he could give his own children as ransom to spare him the retribution of that day. Also his spouse and his brother even his full tribe that raised him, even all the people on earth, if it would save him. Uh, here uh, we see the horror of the of that day, that people will give up from everything that he likes 